Hi and welcome to this online version of our Know More About session on research data management. So in this session we're just going to talk you through the kind of very broad brush basics of what research data is and how to manage it because there's only so much we can cover in one session. When the uh, video is uploaded to YouTube, please do look um, in the notes at the bottom because we'll put some timings and topics in there which will allow you to jump straight to a certain section if you're interested. And also we'll put a link to the slides in there so you can look at them when it's suitable for you. So these are the topics that we're going to cover in this session. We're going to look at what data actually is how um, it can be organized and stored. We're going to um, look at the vital role that open data has in open research, especially when it comes to requirements for archiving and sharing your data. And hopefully this will give you a brief introduction, which will be um, everything you need to know about data. So usually when this happens face to face this is the part with a bit of audience interaction so if you want you can feel free to pause the the recording here and answer this question so what is data what are data depending on um, what you think grammatically how you should be saying data whether it's a plural or not data can basically mean many things and that's often very discipline dependent so there's some examples listed there on the screen the term data covers any of these things that are highlighted here, but a lot of people do struggle to see the information that they work with as data because data usually conjures up images like spreadsheets, um, experiment results, things like that, but actually it's a much broader definition. So for example, if you are doing any kind of literature searching, the um, literature that you create uh, collect during that process is going to be um, part of your data collection. Any field notes, or if you're doing any interviews or transcripts, anything like that. If you're using third party material, so copyrighted material that belongs to somebody else, that involves um, collection and curation of data there. So it's a really, really broad definition. So when we talk about research data, essentially, we mean that anything that is used or produced during the research process in terms of information. So be as broad as you can be in your definition and treat everything as data. So all of the research data that's collected should follow something fairly new called the FAIR data principles. And you can see on the screen there that FAIR is actually an acronym. And this helps the data to be found by both other researchers who might be looking for it or the general public if they're looking for it and indeed makes it um, indexable to machines as well and just gets it out there and makes it more discoverable for people which is good because um, as a researcher sharing your data data is actually a research output on its own which can be cited separately from other research outputs which can therefore increase your citation count so always a good thing if it's more discoverable the FAIR data principles originated at a conference in 2016 and they're meant to act as a guideline for those who want to make sure that their data is both findable and reusable. So you'll see that it's an acronym there on the right hand side. You start off with F for findable and that's just making sure that the data can actually be discovered. So things like adding metadata, so information about the data things like um, assigning a DOI, a digital object identifier, meaning that um, it's always got a stable URL and can always be found, just makes it a little bit easier for someone who's quite frankly going to go to Google and Google something and hopefully what will come up is your data set if you tagged it with the right things, maybe use terms that are very subject specific and maybe more general terms as well to really open up your audience. The second uh, letter of FAIR is an A for accessible. So making it findable is great, but that's only part of the process. You need to ensure that once people have found it, they can actually use it. So this kind of goes hand in hand with the I for interoperable as well. Making sure that you use um, recognized systems and standards and open protocols so people can actually use the data making sure that the data works across different systems. So for example, not using um, proprietary software, maybe using open source software. 
So for example, when this, um, this presentation is shared, what you're looking at here is a PowerPoint produced in Microsoft PowerPoint. I can share that PowerPoint and that's fine for anyone who has access to PowerPoint or equivalent software which can read PowerPoint files, but not everybody does. So we will share this um, presentation as a PDF, which means you may lose potentially some of the kind of um, animations and snazzier aspects and things like that, but all the information will get across and it should be fairly universally accessible. So that's another thing to think about when you're making your data fair. And then the last um, letter is an R for reusable. So ensuring that data can be reused and built upon by anyone who finds it. So this is the, the idea that sharing data opens it up to other people to use it in their projects. So we're not reinventing the wheel all the time. So if you prove something does or doesn't work, you can share the data with someone. They don't waste time trying to prove or disprove the same thing. So you can do this um, by adding an appropriate reuse license to your data, and that may be something that you have a choice in, or that may be something that your funder mandates you have to use a certain license, like a Creative Commons attribution license. But there are various different licenses that you, as the person who created the data, can attach to it. So when we talk about data management, good data management it's basically a little bit like building a jigsaw. You need to have all the right pieces to put together to make a good strategy. There are different ways um, to put together any one strategy and you might find that you spend more time on one of these jigsaw pieces than others and that's perfectly fine. It all varies depending on the nature of the project, the discipline that you're working in and the type of data that you're producing as well. And it's never normally one kind of data that is produced in a project, it's normally a mixture. So don't worry if you spend a, you feel like you're spending a lot of time on one of these elements, as long as there's a balance, it should be fine. So we're going to start with the first jigsaw piece and look at how data can be organised. The information in this section is, I would say, fairly basic. It's likely to be things that, as a researcher, you would do anyway, but you will need to think about them when it comes time to write your data management plan and record them in a more formal way. So it's worth spending that little bit of extra effort just thinking about how and why you do these things. And also there's some useful tips here for organizing information more generally. So files, emails, that kind of thing. So again, this is usually an interactive exercise and you can play along at home if you would like to. So what we normally do is, um, show this to our audience and I suspect many people will recognize at least one of these. Almost all researchers these days work with some kind of digital file. No matter what type of research you're doing, there'll be some kind of digital file involved, even if it's notes that you made um, during a seminar or something like that. In theory, these should be quite easy to find as you can just um, search for the name of the file in your system, but this doesn't always work depending on how you set it up. So what we normally do is ask people whether they think example A or example B of these two file structure systems is better and why. So both of them actually have pros and cons, even though maybe on the face of it, example B seems like the more sensible option. There are pluses and minuses to each one. So if you look at example A, it's going to be really useful for finding files quickly if you've just um, if you're working on something and you've just quickly saved it and you can go straight back to it but it is a little bit messy and you might find that you lose things and obviously the file names that are on there are going to be of limited use in a few years time or indeed if you have new people coming into a project and you're working on shared files or shared drives would your colleagues know what these things meant I mean experiment one meeting notes which meeting which experiment, which um, project is the experiment related to, that kind of thing. Example B is obviously much more structured and easy to follow for um, anyone coming into the project and you as the original researcher should be able to find where your stuff is in this um, system. However, in some cases, depending on where you put things, you might find you have subfolders within these. So within conferences, you might have 
this conference that I went to in this month and this one a couple of months later and then there was this online thing and then this other thing so all of the different conferences would have different folders and you might find that you have to like, constantly drill down through folders in order to find something that you want whereas in example A it's right there when you click through. This is not aim to be really prescriptive we're not saying that one is better than the other what we're saying is that you need to have a system that works for you and for your wider team if that's appropriate and that you all know how to use it so just put a little bit of thought into how you are actually organizing your documentation most people also deal with physical samples and the principles for organizing these are broadly the same as you would with digital samples so what we usually say is create some kind of map to your physical samples so that can be something really simple like a spreadsheet you can keep a note of where things were found what they were used for add in any relevant notes spreadsheets can be quite easily shareable there are lots of open source spreadsheets out there so that's a nice easy one to do it's also really important to reference all samples and keep these up to date. This can be really useful if um, when you're working with things like mixtures of solutions or um, other things in a lab, you can work out when you need to restock or when you're trying to keep a variable the same and referencing can really, really help that. And then at some point, you'll probably be working with some kind of paper notes these can be converted to digital notes if you like there's lots of apps out there that do this or you can just scan it you can take a picture on your phone this can um, help to keep things safe and make them easier to share later on as well so just a little bit of a summary of that section no matter what type of data you're dealing with you need to have a system that will let you do the, the things on the screen so you need to be able to find your files easily when doing any kind of research you're likely to accumulate a lot of material and your system should allow you to go straight to what you need to find when you need to find it the system needs to be meaningful both to you as the person that set it up and any colleagues that you're working with a lot of researchers are quite mobile which means you'll have people coming in and out of a project at different times and it's a quite a good test of your system if people coming into a project can easily understand it and easily work out where things are that they need to find and perhaps most importantly it needs to be consistent choose a system and stick with it or it just ends up being more confusing I know the temptation can be to to swap between different systems if certain people have preferences or you kind of take little bits from different systems and mix them together but this gets really really confusing really really fast and undermines the whole process so organization could look however you want it to essentially unless you have an existing local policy that you have to use your system can be whatever works for you as a researcher the important thing as we keep saying is that the system allows you to find what you need when you need it and that other people can interpret it so depending on whether you're um, pessimistic or not you can look at this as the what if I get hit by a bus protocol or what if I win the lottery protocol so if you win the lottery tomorrow and you quit and you decide that's it I'm never coming back to work again would somebody else be able to come in and pick up your files if they needed to so just have that in the back of your mind when you're organizing things it sounds silly but helps the message to stick one of the easiest ways to organize your information is by using something called a file naming convention so if you look um, at the examples on the screen here they kind of uh, reflect back on example a and our two file structures we looked at earlier would you know what any of these files were if you came back to them in three years even the uh, spreadsheet there that has um, a date element in the label the results from what we don't know or Smith article Smith is a fairly common surname you may not be able to find the one you want when it comes to it this is one of those things that it's best to get straight early and it might seem like a hassle to set it up initially but it can save a heck of a lot of time and effort in the long run So 
again, there are many different examples of systems out there and you might want to check if you're expected to use a certain one. The one that you see on the screen here is actually borrowed from the Queensland University of Technology and they use a series of components to construct a file name. So it starts off with a prefix which um, describes the type of file. So in this case, PRE stands for presentation. And you could have um, MEM for a memo, um, LST for a list, all sorts of different things. And there's a big long list on the Queensland University of Technology website. If you look for the TILS document naming convention, there's a great big PDF that explains what all of the prefixes are. Following this is the actual name of the document, the document title. It's best to keep this as something sensible and something short and something that most people would look for, just because that's good practice. It then has the version number, so which, which version or draft of a document it is. Now, you might need to have a chat if you're working in a team about what counts as a new version. Is it just something like updating a spelling mistake? Is it a, a major change that you make, like adding more paragraphs or rearranging things? And you need to get this sorted at the beginning, otherwise different people will be labeling things in different ways. And it's really important that you're consistent through this. So if it's, if it's only a little spelling change, you may think actually that doesn't constitute a new version. I'm just going to name it a new version when there's been a substantial change. Otherwise, you'll be up to version 105 before you know it. The next element is the date element. So this is the date that it was last updated. So version 1 was updated, if you look at the date, on the 6th of February 2020. So it starts with the year, then the month, then the date. And there is a reason for this, which I will explain in a second. And then finally, and this is kind of an optional element, not everybody does it, but you can put the initials of the person who last updated it on there if that's something that's important to your work. It depends, again, how things work in your own um, environment. So the reason that the elements are in this order and the reason that the dates and versions matter is that when you have a long list of documents, you can actually order them so it will, using this filing system. So it will keep all of the presentations together, all of the memos together, all of the spreadsheets together. And then you will see that maybe have four versions of the data management presentation, and it will do it by um, version number and by date. So you can go immediately to the latest version of a presentation, or you know that there was something you changed that was two versions back, for example, or you know you did it on a certain date, and that will help you find what you need really quickly when you need it. So just a short summary of file naming conventions here, and this is adapted from some JISC guidance on what makes a good file name, which also makes a really good read on a web page. So whatever system you use, it needs to have the following four characteristics. It needs to be objective, so the name, the actual main file name needs to make it clear what it is to everyone. So if you think back to the previous slide, we called this data management presentation. It's fairly self-explanatory what that is. If I'd called it RDM presentation, short for research data management, that may cause confusion with people who didn't know what RDM was. It should be meaningful, so you need to avoid abbreviations and uh, any personal shorthand you have as well. We all have that element of personal shorthand, but this is about making it accessible to as many people in the team as possible. It should be concise, because if you have really, really long file names, it's going to mean that things can get lost and um, harder to remember and actually harder to find, so keep it brief if you can. And it needs to be standardised in some way. So the system as a whole and the individual components both need to be standardised if that's the way you choose to go. So everyone should use the same date format, otherwise you lose that ability to order things. So once you have the data organised, you need to think about the next puzzle piece, which is how you're actually going to store the information that you've collected and created. 
most people um, just say when in response to this kind of thing that they'll back it up on a drive, which is one, certainly one way of doing it, but there's a bit more to think about. So we know that backing up our data is something that we all should do, but also something that many of us leave until either the last minute or later when we think we're going to have time and then later never comes. I'm a librarian, I'm as guilty of this than, as anybody. Just because you're a librarian doesn't mean you always follow the correct protocol, although please don't tell my boss. So the examples you see on the screen are kind of the worst case scenario, extreme circumstances. So you've got university fires, um, storage servers that crash, and a vast amount of data that can be lost if things go wrong. And if you think about how much these disasters could potentially set back life-saving research, it's really, really worrying if things aren't backed up. Think as well about the, the smaller examples, the things that you see and experience every day. So your misplaced USB drive, I've certainly lost more than one over the years. What happens if your computer crashes, your, your laptop just stops working and there's nothing you can do about it? And think about the amount of data that you could lose in each of these everyday situations. It doesn't have to be something as extreme as what you see on the screen. So again, you can tell that I like my jigsaw metaphors. Creating a data backup strategy, which is the most important thing about storing your data, is again a bit like putting together the individual pieces to create your own bespoke jigsaw puzzle. And different projects that you're working on will need different versions of this. So just because you've used one data backup plan for one project doesn't mean that you're wedded to it forever. You can chop and change and use different ones. It's about putting the pieces together and having that knowledge to create your bespoke strategy. So we'll start with the method of backup. Think about how you're actually going to back up your data and your information. Is there a local automated system if you're working for the university? If you're at Cambridge, in normal circumstances, there are automated backups of uh, university-owned machines when they're connected to the network. Or do you have to set something up yourself? And there are programs you can get which you can install on your own computers, which will allow you to run automated backups, perhaps overnight, perhaps during a meeting when you know you're not going to be creating any kind of new data. You can, of course, use external drives, use things like USBs or larger external drives, but it's important to remember that there is a cost implication here, and if you're producing an awful lot of data, that cost is going to add up very quickly, so you might need to think of something different. The best advice around choosing a method of data backup is to have two methods that will store the amount that you need and to keep those two in separate locations, which sounds really, really obvious, but if you imagine backing your data up on a hard drive, external hard drive, and on your laptop, and then you put them both in your backpack and your backpack gets stolen or you leave it on the train or whatever it is, then you've lost everything. You've lost both the, the data and the backup. So the next thing you need to think about is frequency. How often will you be backing the material up? So what we normally say is the more important the data are and the more they change, the more frequent backups will need to be, which is very common sense if you think about it. But just think about how much you're producing each day and how much you need to back up. There's also where you actually store the location and this store the data. So this is really important if your grant, your research grant mandates that it's kept within a certain geographic location, because what a lot of people want to do is to use cloud backup services, so Google Drive, Dropbox, things like that, which is fine to a certain extent. But if your um, research grant mandates that all data is kept within the EU, for example, do you know when you're backing up with an online backup service where that data is actually going to be stored. It's probably going to be stored on a server in the US, which would put it outside the EU, which would mean that technically you're breaking your grant restrictions. So you need to 
double check what your restrictions are and make sure that you are keeping to them. And then we kind of touched on this with frequency, but the last one is amount. You don't have to back up everything you've ever created every single day. It might just be you back up what you've created that day, that week, however often you need to do it and however much you think you need to do. So the best advice is to think about how much data you could stand to lose and always back up that amount. So the main takeaway message of this section is always back up your information in at least two locations and keep these apart from each other. Again, sounds really simple and stuff that you probably do to a certain extent anyway, but you will have to think about this more formally when you're preparing something like a data management plan. They will ask to know what your um, backup and storage strategy is. So we've touched on this a little bit, but just to reiterate about cloud services, it is important to use these with caution. They do have their place, but you need to know what you're getting into. So the first thing you should do is always read the terms and conditions when you're signing up. And again, I know this is something that few of us, myself included, tend to do. When you sign up for a new service, it will give you a link to terms and conditions. And this can be any online service, any app. And you just click yes because you want to use the thing. No one ever reads the reams of um, small print, but you will need to do so to make sure that you know what you're agreeing to because that's just good practice and that it meets any funder storage requirements and that you're not accidentally breaking any restrictions. At Cambridge, the university has a range of solutions. So even if you're at a different institution, it does pay to investigate what the university or the institution offers. They have, uh, most universities have a kind of local instance of a cloud service, which will give you more storage, slightly more protection. But remember that when you um, are using these services, you will likely need to be signed in with your university email credentials because otherwise they don't know that you're with the university and that when you leave the university, those credentials may stop working very, very quickly. So you'll need to have some kind of backup email in place, even if it's something like a, a generic Gmail address, for example. Otherwise, you could lose access to all of your data. And be really careful when you're storing any sensitive or personal information using these services, because again, they may not meet the, the standard security requirements for that kind of sensitive data. So be really, really careful just know what you're getting into with the cloud storage. So the next step is archiving your data. And this is important both to preserve your research and your research outputs and prepare it for sharing so that other people can come along and build on the work that you've done in the future. So you're helping not just yourself as a researcher, now you're helping the researcher of the future. This is a horrible slide and I apologise, but it's a legal slide, so it's got to have lots of text on it. The General Data Protection Regulation, otherwise known as GDPR, came into force in May 2018. And it actually changed the rules governing how personal data can be collected and stored. So it's really, really important if you're dealing with any personal information that you pay attention to this. It also expanded the definition of what counts as personal data and increased the penalty for any data breaches. And that penalty would fall on the researcher rather than the institution in most cases. So you could be looking at an incredibly hefty fine if you did anything wrong. And it can be from hundreds to thousands to millions in some cases of pounds, or that's usually reserved for, for large breaches by institutions. It's important to reiterate actually at this point that what counts as personal data is actually quite broad in itself. So it's anything that could identify a person either directly or indirectly. So you need to be really, really careful when you're collecting any of that kind of information and actually really question whether you need to. Important to note as well that if you're using consent forms, which you should be doing if you're collecting any personal data, which explain to the participant exactly what the project is, which, what information you're collecting and how you're going to use it, 
that you obtain something called informed open consent. So the consent form needs to inform participants exactly how their information will be used. So when um, previous to kind of the advent of open research and data sharing, the information collected was mainly used for research projects. It may go in a journal, obviously would be anonymized, and that would all be set out in the in the document. Now, with the kind of requirements, especially if you're doing a PhD and at Cambridge, you are required to um, share your PhD online at the end of your work, and that counts as publication. And what a participant may be willing to tell you for an academic reason, for an academic assignment, may be different to what they are willing to see published on the internet, no matter how um, anonymized you make that data. So you need to make clear to the participant exactly what they're potentially getting themselves into. So I will use this information for my PhD. It will be published online at the end of the process. Here's where it will be shared. It may be turned into a journal article and you need to get all of this permission up front as you can't go back and do it later. And if you do, it creates more mess than you want to know about. So really important to think about this. With GDPR, there is a responsibility on you as the researcher that you need to notify the university or institution of any potential data breach within 72 hours of it happening. So you have a little bit of time but you do need to identify, um, notify the university that this has happened and steps would need to be taken. You also need to um, remember the right to be forgotten, which means that people can actually request to have their details removed from research at any point during the research process, and that needs to be part of the consent form. As I said, the um, organisation and the individual researcher now have an increased responsibility for any data breaches and um, any monetary responsibility as well. So minor issues, there is a maximum, and this is an absolute maximum, 10 million euro fine. For major issues, it's a maximum 20 million euro fine. So in terms of Cambridge, this could cost quite a lot of money. That's going to come out of a future research budget. There is, if you're at Cambridge, an information compliance website, which the university offers more and more information on there, the most up-to-date information. You will need your Raven password to sign in with it, which um, for any non-Cambridge people listening is a Cambridge identification system. But you will be able to get help there and reassurance, and it will talk you through the whole process. So just some basic advice to follow to ensure that you protect any personal or sensitive data that you have. Really think about whether you need to actually collect it and only collect the information that you actually need. Because personal data covers such a broad range of things that can be used to identify anyone that there are lots of steps you have to put in place to secure it. If you actually don't need that information, don't collect it and save yourself the hassle. As I've said, you need to obtain informed, open and most importantly, written consent. So participants will need to sign in some way a consent form. Verbal permission is not enough. You essentially need something that can be backed up in court if needed. So you need to have um, their written consent that they're happy for work, for their information to go in the work. They're happy for that work to be shared in print and online, maybe via a repository, and that they may be happy in the future for it to be turned into a journal article, conference presentation, or other output. Goes without saying, I hope that you should anonymize all data. And this can include if you've got a large data set with lots of information in it, you might need to split it up into different data sets. So you might need to put job titles in one, locations in another, mix it around a bit. So if you're working in a very niche area, for example, that you, someone who works in a certain job role within a certain type of institution in a certain country may be very identifiable. So you need to think about all these kinds of things. And when it comes time to share the data, you can use what's called managed access repositories to share it. This complies with the sharing rules that funders set down and the expectation that you will put that information out there. 
but also keeps it protected and gives it that extra level of protection. So that leads us nicely on to sharing data, which is part of the wider move towards open research practices. And this basically ensures that the outcomes of any research are shared with those who are interested. And that might be a member of the public that's interested. It might be someone doing an academic assignment. It may be another researcher working on a similar project. By sharing data, it does allow knowledge to move forward and helps contribute to the wider academic environment. So there are naturally different motivations for sharing data. You can broadly divide these into two areas, the kind of the carrots and the sticks. So the carrots, the kind of nice, warm and fuzzy reasons, is that allowing others to use your data helps to move knowledge forward. And this is around the globe. And if you look, um, as I'm recording this, we're during the coronavirus outbreak. This is an excellent example of um, the importance of releasing data to the wider world because there is information out there that will help. We're starting to actually see it be released so researchers can get on and investigate treatments and a potential vaccine for it. A slightly more selfish reason is that it does increase your citations as a researcher because Data counts as its own individual output. It can be cited separately from um, any articles, conferences, whatever else you produce. And so it's something else that will be out there gathering citations and increasing your profile within the academic community. It stops people repeating the same research again and again. And this is particularly true of research that has negative outputs. So where you have, for example, tried an experiment to prove something and actually prove that it can't be done. People are very reluctant to publish on this, although that's starting to change now and I can understand why. But it's really important because otherwise, if we don't tell people something doesn't work, then there'll be 20 other research teams working on prove, trying to prove that something works when you've already proved it doesn't work. So even if you don't want to take it to a full paper or another output, you can release the data and say, hey, I've done this thing. It doesn't work this way. Maybe try it a different way. And it saves that effort and essentially saves money. There's also a very um, important thing to think about is the research reproducibility crisis. So we need to be able to check and verify results of published research. And there'll be more on this on the next slide as we get to it. Then the kind of the sticks, the, the not so nice reasons. It does help to preserve the integrity of both the research and the researcher and protects from any kind of speculation or accusation of any kind of misconduct, which does unfortunately happen. So if you allow people to double check your work, if you allow people to um, see your methods and open and transparent, they can see what you've done. They can see that you've not made any mistakes, that you've not been dishonest anywhere. It protects you from any allegations. And also on the flip side of that, exposes fraud when it does happen, which unfortunately it does. There was a very famous case in Japan a few years ago where um, researchers claimed that they had added something to a cell and turned it into a stem cell. And this was big news in the scientific community. Lots of people were very excited about this discovery and it turned out that it had been fabricated. It had really tragic results because the, um, the research lab shut down, careers were devastated over it and really tragically, the lead researcher actually took his own life as a result of the shame that was felt through um, this research misconduct. So it's really important to be able to, to put that research out there and have it checked. You've also got funder mandates and also university policies, which say that research outputs, including the data which underpins any publication, has to be shared. And this is basically if none of the other reasons on the screen have moved you, you have to stick to those two because it would be a condition of your funding that you must do this. Sorry. So as I touched on in the previous slide, there is a reproducibility crisis in science, or at least some people claim there is. I am one of these people. 
So the um, the study on the left from Nature, which was actually conducted back in 2016, said that um, many scientific studies are actually impossible for people, other researchers, to reproduce. So 70% can't reproduce the work of other people and 50% can't reproduce their own work. And this is worrying because we need to be able to see how people got to their conclusions. It helps to protect against possible fraud. So for example, had the results in the, the Japanese case been shared up front, perhaps there wouldn't have been such tragic consequences and certainly for people's lives and careers. There's also um, really important to note that making data available allows others to, to test your conclusions and this really results in improved science. So it's, not, it's not about proving you've done nothing wrong. It's not about you know, anyone judging your reputation. It's just about improving the process more generally. But it does also have the side effect that it can protect you from accusations of misconduct. So that's a bit about the why, but now the how of sharing data. So data should be shared at the time of publication or even before publication and then linked to the published version so that someone can come along and see your paper and then can see the data that underpins that paper should they wish to. At this point, most people get quite worried and they think that, well, if I re release my data, people are going to steal it and use it and publish on it before I've had a chance to. But actually, as with any kind of um, online sharing, sharing data actually helps to protect it from theft because it gives it a date stamp. So if you have released your data in the January and then someone comes along six months later and releases a paper and said we only came up with this two months ago you could say oh, actually this is my data from January you can see when I uploaded it that proves I had the idea first. So once you have um, found a suitable time to do it you need to find a suitable repository. So a repository is a collection of outputs there are several dedicated data ones there are more general ones Perhaps the funder, sometimes they um, will specify that you need to use a specific one and sometimes you'll have to choose one and we'll cover this more on the next slide. Thinking back to the fair data principles from earlier, you need to describe and license your data. So think about how you would want others to use it, whether there's any restrictions you want to place on that, whether you have the ability to do so. You need to also think about adding metadata and a readme file to your data. So describing what your, what's in your data set, what format it's in, um, how, you, how it's um, arranged, that kind of thing. Just to make it easier for someone else to come along and use your data because releasing data is great, but you need to make it usable and understandable to someone outside of the project. And then you also need to think about any potential cost implications to sharing data, especially if it's a large amount. Online repositories do sometimes charge for large amounts of data and you'll need to build this into any budget, otherwise you might um, be faced with an unexpected bill. So repositories do preserve and share a range of outputs, including data. And there are lots of different data repositories available. General ones that will accept anything, ones that are either format or subject specific, and indeed institutional repositories such as Cambridge has Apollo, and all institutions will likely have something similar. So the first thing you need to think about, as I said, is um, what the grant actually specifies. So if your research grant says you must share it in this repository, then the decision's out of your hands and in some ways is easier. If you have choice, you need to think um, about what your peers use and where they will actually go looking for the data. So what's going to be the most useful place for you to put your data to make it more discoverable to people? The um, advice from Cambridge, if you have completely free choice about where to put your data, is to go for a subject specific one as your first choice and then 
If you can't find a suitable subject specific, use the institutional repository because then it will be linked to the Cambridge name. Good publicity. And if for any reason you don't or can't use Apollo, the Cambridge repository, then you can go for a more general one. But that's the kind of thought process that you should be going through. So you can see some examples on the screen here. There are many, many different ones. A very useful resource is V3 Data at the top there, which is um, a registry of lots of different data repositories. And it offers a lot of guidance as well on how to select the best one, what the difference is, what the kind of features are, and, and more importantly, what any costs are. So because I work for Cambridge, I am contractually obliged to recommend Apollo, which is the University of Cambridge repository, if you've not come across it. It's well indexed by Google, largely free to use, although for larger data sets there is a charge. It does take all kinds of output, and you can see there it's, a, it's arranged in school, but you can um, filter it down by all sorts of different things, and you do have the ability to link both publications and data sets together. So if you're listing from outside Cambridge, I'm sure your institution has something similar. So you also need to consider how you want other people to use your data once you've shared it. You're the creator of the data, which isn't supposed to rhyme, but that means you have the control over what's done with it in most circumstances. So find a license which outlines how you want the data to be used, including whether you will allow others to make use of it in their own work and or make any money from that use. Your funder, as with everything else, um, may specify a certain license or a certain level of access. So there are licenses such as Creative Commons, Apache license, the general public license, all kinds of different ones. Many people are understandably quite worried about sharing and licensing their data. But the important thing to remember is that in many circumstances, you control the license because you make the choice about which license you put on it. So it's really important to think these things through first before putting the license on it, because once you put a license on it, it's hard and in some cases impossible to revoke that license. So you need to know what you're doing first. You need to spend some solid time investigating options and thinking about this. The general advice that we give people is to be as open as possible and as closed as necessary. So it's kind of a happy medium. So especially if you're dealing with any personal or sensitive information, you may be restricted in how you can license it and how openly you can make it available. So be as open as you possibly can and as restrictive as is needed, depending on your, your funder, your project, your data. It's kind of a balancing act. So all of the elements that we've discussed in this um, webinar come together in one document, which is called the Data Management Plan. Now, we do have a separate session slash video on data management plans, which you can watch if you'd like to. So the Data Management Plan, or the DMP, as it's sometimes referred to, is an outline of how the data will be managed and shared both during and after a project. So this document is increasingly being mandated by both funders and institutions as a way to show that any grant recipients, any researcher will be responsible with the money they get and will be responsible with the project overall. Cambridge is increasingly mandating that a data management plan will be drawn up prior to a project because it's good to get you thinking about all of the areas we've discussed even if you think back to the beginning and we were discussing some quite obvious things about naming files and backing them up and storing them but it's still good to actually have a mechanism to think through these uh, processes and data management plans offer that for you and also it's just a good part of academic practice to make sure you know what you're doing you need to remember that a data management plan is a living document. It should be updated throughout the length of the project. It's not something that you just you do and you stick in the drawer and you forget about for three years. You go back to it, you constantly refer to it, you update it when needed. 
and it also extends beyond the project so you need to think about what happens in terms of sharing data after the project access that kind of thing so again another awful slide i apologize it's very hard to fit all of the components on on one slide so a data management plan different funders will have different plan layouts different mandates about the exact things they expect to see um, described but these are some of the most common areas that you might see in a plan so you think about the source of the data whether you've collected it yourself whether you're using existing data did you get permission for that how was that permission obtained why are you um, collecting new data or why are you using existing data what was your rationale for that decision then you need to think about the type of data so what format will the data be in and it can have different um, formats of data within the same project they can all go in one data management plan you don't need to do a new plan for each different data type it's at project level then you need to think about how you're going to back up your data and store your information how you're going to store it during the project how you're going to store it after the project's finished what the cost implication is going to be so again all of the things that we've discussed perhaps one of the biggest areas is sharing so how will the data be shared in compliance with both uh, regulations such as GDPR and any funder requirements that you have important to think about how it's going to be shared between team members as well so what's the security protocol going to be don't want to be just emailing your um, lab partner with lots of different personal data you need to have some kind of secure mechanism for that that feeds into the ethics section so which ethical standards are you going to use how are these going to be adhered to what steps are you going to take that kind of thing and then finally responsibility so someone usually the PI or other lead researcher needs to have overall responsibility for the data and the documentation so who is this person what happens if that person moves on what happens if they win the lottery and don't come back you know what's the succession plan lots and lots of different areas to think about there so that just gives you kind of a, a broad approach and kind of sums up what we've been talking about in this session So if this was a live session at this point I would ask the audience for any questions however it's recorded so you can feel free to shout them at the screen but I won't hear but the um, more RSO research office um, email address is on the screen please do feel free to drop us an email we're looking into um, instant chat online appointments that kind of thing we hope to have that set up really really soon please do make use of us we are here to help you even if it's online rather than face to face but thanks very much for listening and good luck with your data management